good afternoon, and I'm Julie Broadway, president at the American Horse Council. We're delighted to have you with us for our fourth quarter uh, mm -hmm. 2023 uh, webinar. I don't know about you, but I can hardly believe we're in You're November. welcome to come in here if you want. This year has just flown by. Um, for those of you who are joining us today, a couple of housekeeping things. Please be sure if you're not speaking to put yourself on mute so we don't have any background noise or interrupt our guest. Um, we will have some open Q&A towards the end, so store up those questions or put them in the chat. We'll get to those. Um, also, we are recording this session, so the recording will be available in a day or two um, up on our website. Uh, so feel free to go back, listen again if you've got some nuances that you want to hear, um, or if you have to drop off and you want to just hear the rest of it. So uh, with that, uh, Emily Stearns is our health, welfare, and regulatory affairs person at the Horse Council, and she's leading this webinar today. So Emily, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Emily, so this topic has come up from kind of multiple angles. It has come to us from industry members, um, individual members. Basically, there's kind of a lot happening on the enforcement and EPA side. So we figured we would take a minute, talk to everybody about what CAFOs are, and hopefully try to help people understand how it's going to impact the horse industry. So what the heck even is a CAFO? And a CAFO is short for Concentrated Animal Feed Operation. And what it means is if you have an operation with horses or dairy cows or beef cows or poultry, turkeys, chickens, sheep, any sort of livestock, and they are kept in an area confined for 45 days, does not have to be consecutive, out of 365 days a year, in an area where no vegetation or other edible forage grows in the confinement area during a typical growing season, then you are likely considered or qualify for an animal feed operation. If you exceed a certain number of animal units on your property, you then likely qualify as a CAFO, a concentrated animal feed operation. So what this means is what's an animal unit? Animal unit is the EPA designation of one animal and it can be of multiple species. So a cow, a dairy cow animal unit, is different from a beef cow animal unit or a sheep animal unit or a horse animal unit. And a species designation as one animal unit is dependent on their manure output and the nutrient quality of their manure output. And it kind of all goes into this one big algorithm for how they determine what an animal unit is. So if you have a horse operation, just to simplify, and it's only horses in your operation. If you have up to 150 horses in your operation and you meet the other standards of a concentrated feeding operation, so the animals are confined to an area where forage doesn't grow for 45 days or more out of one year, then you could be considered a small CAFO. And we say could be, this will be important when we kind of talk later about further qualifications for CAFO. If you have between 150 and 499 horses on your property, you could qualify as a medium CAFO. If you have 500 horses or more on your property, then you likely qualify as a large CAFO. And CAFOs are identified as point source discharges under the Clean Water Act. And the reason this is important, and the reason why this starts to cause a headache for everybody, is point source discharges being identified as a source of pollution need to be regulated by the EPA and have a significant number of kind of remediations that they need to follow in order to operate their business. So if you kind of check or you think you might check a lot of the boxes for CAFO, then moving forward, this is kind of the ABCs of CAFOs. There are a lot of acronyms when we're talking about federal and state agencies. So starting with the CWA, the Clean Water Act. The Clean Water Act passed in 1970. And this is when CAFOs, large, these large animal feeding operations, were identified as point source discharges. 
And just to keep in context, this was not, you know, an out to get agriculture kind of situation. Many industries are identified as point source discharges. So we have, there's uh, mining industries, there's other production fabrication industries, oil, they're all kind of considered point source discharges. But what specifically falls under the CWA is anything that abuts a body of water that is further defined under WOTUS. So our next level of letter soup is the waters of the U.S. And waters of the U.S. is the act that defines navigable waters that fall under the jurisdiction for the EPA and other kind of federal agencies to oversee. So if your CAFO abuts something defined in the waters of the U.S., then you will likely need to be regulated under CAFO rules. If your CAFO, if your feeding operation does not have runoff or running water on your property that falls under WOTUS, then unless there are state specific regulations, then you likely are not considered a CAFO, you are just a standard animal feeding operation, which doesn't work as a get out of jail free card. You might not necessarily need to comply under CAFO laws or CAFO regulations. There are likely other large animal ag regulations you need to follow. Um, air emissions is one that's up and coming. But for the sake of CAFOs, it all really goes back to waters of the US and the CWA, the Clean Water Act. Who defines waters of the U.S.? This is the really big sticking point and a really hot topic that came up this year. So the Army Corps of the Engineers and EPA work together to define the waters under CAFO. And this year in particular, there was a court, a case that made it all the way up to SCOTUS, the Supreme Court, to redefine what was defined under WOTUS. So there was a farmer to really kind of boil it down to bare basics. There was a farmer, he had uh, turned over a bunch of land into new fields and filled in some low points in his fields. And the EPA and Army Corps brought uh, CAFO and compliance charges against him because they said that his water, the kind of wet lowlands should have qualified under WOTUS and he needed to submit several million dollars in remediation for the land he had filled in. In this case, the farmer had questioned whether his land had fallen under WOTUS. And the Supreme Court, um, actually in a totally unanimous decision, nine out of nine, said that the WOTUS definitions were too vague and it was not able to be fairly applied to this situation because the definitions were too vague. And so the entire kind of write-up of WOTUS went back this year to the Army Corps and the EPA for new definitions. And those new definitions were released in the fall. So with those new definitions, that can redefine what operations fall under CAFO regulations. So how does EPA oversee all of the operations falling under CAFO? and even determining who falls under CAFO. So that word soup goes down here to the NPDES, the National Pollutant Discharge uh, Elimination System. And NPDES authorizes states to take applications for CAFOs and give them permits or not give them permits. And at the state level, that is who's deciding. EPA has authorized uh, all but three states to operate the NPDES permitting system. The three states who are not authorized are Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and New Mexico. In those states, everybody operating in those states has to specifically deal with items at the state level. So if we're talking about CAFO, we're talking about federal regulation. To further complicate it, you can have states who have uh, increased compliance requirements for CAFO regulations. So state and local regulations also factor really heavily into this. So some things, if you are considered a CAFO that you have to remediate, might only be required at your state level. And there are a lot of different agencies at the state level 
that can be in charge of kind of overseeing who even complies with CAFO stuff. And at the state level, that can either be your Department of Environmental Protection, that can be your local boards of health, that could be your state department of ags. So it's really important when we kind of get further into this compliance and even understanding if you are a CAFO to understand who you go to if you have questions. And we'll talk about that shortly. So the big question is, how do I know if my operation qualifies? And we keep saying operation, but again, because there are so many different requirements and regulations at the state level, if you are not a business, but you have livestock on your property and you have wetlands on your property or a butt wetlands or your manure might run off into some sort of WOTUS to find water, your state might still regulate you as an animal feeding operation or a small CAFO, a, a two horse CAFO. Um, I grew up in Massachusetts, and even though it doesn't have NPDES oversight, they do have a lot of really strict local uh, nutrient management planning laws and animal unit planning laws just overseen at the uh, city level. So knowing your local regulations is really important. And just assuming you don't qualify and don't need to worry about this because you're not a business is also really important to understand. Know your local regulations because whether or not you're a business, if you have livestock, it's important to know how your property falls under different water runoff. So who can you go to is the other really big question. And so I just talked about that brochure I had, let me go back a slide. This brochure is actually coming off of the EPA website and they have brochures for every single species. These brochures, I will caveat, have not been updated since 2007. So you could imagine that there is some outdated information. So always ask your local agency representative for updates. But the big places I would go, and at the end of the presentation, I, I'll show you these websites directly, but the EPA has a list of local representatives in every state who can answer your burning CAFO questions. The other place you can go is your State Department of Agriculture. And a lot of states recommend that you first go to your State Department of Agriculture because they'll know how the local regulations and the state regulations intersect and work with the federal regulations. Um, if you don't know how to contact your local State Department of Agriculture, the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture has a list of contact for every single state. Um, so that website is really helpful. This also falls under to some research that the American Horse Council has been doing this past year. And this is where it gets a little concerning. So horses fall into kind of this gray area when we're talking about federal regulatory efforts and state and local uh, regulatory efforts. We had an intern contact every single state to understand how many horse CAFOs are operating or designated in every state. And again, while this varies state to state greatly, um, depending on what the state regulatory changes are. So states like Pennsylvania have really strict state regulations where nearly every livestock property, regardless of size, is uh, regulated on, under some sort of animal feeding operation law. Um, but for other states, concerningly, our intern found that 50% of the states, 25 states nearly, did not know, A, that horse operations likely qualified under regular uh, CAFO permitting, B, didn't know how to figure out how many horse operations were operating under CAFO regulations in their uh, state, and C, didn't think horses qualified at all. So this kind of speaks to a much bigger issue that not only do us as owner operators not know how we need to comply with this, but the states actually don't know how we need to be complying with this. And that's a big problem because if you don't know how you need to comply and the enforcers don't know how you need to comply, there can be a lot of room for surprises that cost millions of dollars on the owner operator side. 
So there's a lot of concerns and, and that's where we as the horse council are kind of trying to get involved. But it also means that we as owner operators need to think about how we can open up discussions with our department of ags. So one big thought and one big question we get is, you know, this sounds like a really big ag problem and a really big government problem. And me, Emily, with my three horses at home, this isn't my problem. I don't need to worry about this. So again, I've, I've kind of mentioned this already and I can't impress the importance of this enough, but state regulations vary greatly. And you need to know your local and state regs because just because you're not operating a 500 plus horse breeding operation doesn't mean that there are nutrient management plan requirements you have to have, manure management plan requirements you have to have, a limit to the number of horses you can have on your property or a limit per acre, which is something that's starting to exist in towns. And if you have other animals, other livestock on your property, beef cows, dairy cows, poultry, uh, sheep, those animal units are all cumulative. And that also qualifies towards your total number of animals on the property. So it's not just horses that are included. And so many of us have multiple animals at home on top of the large venues who are doing um, beef and dairy shows, who are doing sheep and wool festivals, as well as, you know, equine affair and, and large uh, horse shows and horse racing tracks and things like that. So again, know your state regulations. The other big issue, and this is kind of one of the number one topics and why knowing who needs to comply with this is important, is that environmental activist groups are bringing private lawsuits to operations for not complying. So while the EPA and the local uh, you know, state department agencies are in charge of enforcing this, um, it does feel like to these environmental activists that there is not enough enforcement happening and they are exercising their right to bring private lawsuits to operations for not complying with laws that are not being enforced against them that just because it's not being enforced doesn't mean you don't have to comply um this is part of what happened out in california with del mar and it's kind of starting to spread across the country a little bit. So making sure you are on the up with compliance doesn't just protect you against enforcement um, from the federal and state level, but it also saves you the headache of kind of protecting yourself against these situations. The last part that's really important to keep track of is the EPA is recognizing with changing WOTUS definitions, Waters of the US, and changing enforcement and administrative goals, which we'll talk about in a minute, that we really need to evaluate how we're measuring pollutants being discharged and how we're measuring these impacts of these point source discharges. So for the ag industry, that's really important in terms of manure. There's something called EPA Plan 15, which is the new effluent guideline plan effluent runoff stuff that's running into water um the epa is planning to study each industry so there's seven sectors seven industry sectors that are considered point source dischargers and they're going to study how their pollutants have changed over the years how uh effluent is changing over the years and see if anything needs to be updated or changed from you know, I said that brochure hasn't been updated since 2008. This is how they're planning to make updates. So EPA Plan 15, they are starting, I believe, with oil and chemical manufacturing um, to study the impacts of those discharges. An agricultural impact study is coming. It'll likely be 2025 or later. Um, the Horse Council, we're working to make sure that horse discharges, so manure, horse poop, is accurately studied and that research associated with manure runoff is accurately studied. Um, one aspect that we feel is not considered in horse CAFO compliance is our husbandry practices. So our husbandry practices, you know, kind of vary or or are much different from how production beef and production dairy, even production uh, lamb 
is handled, how manure is handled, how manure is picked up and stored. So for something like horse manure, we're picking stalls almost every day um, at large venues, at racetracks. They're definitely picking stalls multiple times a day and that manure is being stored differently than say a wet manure storage system for dairy or poultry um, or beef feedlots where the manure is just kind of left out in the field for a really long time or the field in that feedlot for a really long time and then scraped occasionally. So bringing in husbandry practices into the conversation, the manure management conversation, I think is important. So talking about compliance, we wanted to bring you a firsthand experience with compliance. So we have today with us Joe Wilson, the CEO of Parks Racing in Pennsylvania. So Joe, if you can, unmute yourself. Uh. <laughs> Perfect. There so Joe, go. thank you for joining us today. Could you just take a second and introduce yourself and introduce Parks? Yeah, so I'm I'm Joe Wilson. I'm the, as Emily said, I'm the CEO of Parks Racing here in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm a, a thoroughbred horse racing track. I have anywhere between twelve and thirteen hundred horses that are on my backstretch year round. Um, just a little bit about my experience with all this. So back in the early '90s, uh, the Pennsylvania DEP came to the track and said, "Hey." We believe you're in, you know, violation of, you know, runoff, everything else. So there was a consent order and agreement that was done. A couple of basins were built on the property. Uh, storm drains were put in and, you know, one basin took half the property. The other basin took the other half. If the one basin filled up, it would pump the, the water through a swale into the main basin. And all of this was tied directly into the sanitary sewer. And there was a diversion structure. So uh, once we got an inch of rain, that diversion structure actually opened up. And instead of that rainwater going into the sanitary sewer, it filled up the basin. So if the basin got too full, it would overflow. It would go into a nearby creek. And as Emily talked about, waters of the U.S. Um, and it was originally we had to cover a 10-year, 12-hour um, storm event. They then changed it to a 20 year, 24 hour storm event where you could not build a basin big enough. So they did this back in around 2008. And the one thing with the DEP, they won't tell you what to do. So if you ask them, hey, how can I you know, avoid this or not get fined or whatever, they won't tell you. They'll just tell you that you were in violation. So hence the whole you know, first time I was exposed to the word CAFO, um, and yes, it can be a nightmare. Um, so we went back and forth with them. And, and another Im important thing, if you find yourself um, getting called upon by your state's DEP or the EPA or whatever, uh, best thing you can do is hire a consultant. There are plenty of agricultural consultants that all they deal with is CAFOs and odor management plans, NIPTES permits, everything else. So we did that, and what happened was, so we had, along with the basins and the storm drains, we had open pits between the barns. So stalls were, were mucked, wheelbarrowed into the open pit. Obviously, the rain would come down on it. It would get picked up a couple times a week. Um, that was the first thing that they were mainly concerned with, that rain was hitting that manure into the storm drain, into the basin, ultimately could wind up into the creek. So we had to put in um, covered containers all through the backstretch. We have um, both shavings and straw, um, and they are different purposes. So the straw, the mushroom guys come and pick up to grow mushrooms, and the shavings are ground up into like a top dressing. So there are two different companies back there pulling these containers. We had to build a very large uh, manure barn mm -hmm. because you have to keep these, you know, uh, containers empty, it would get stored under a roof until they would come a couple times a week and take a trailer load out. They also um, fined us for people were outside um, washing their horse in between the barns. And, you know, a, a lot of us, you, you kind of act like surprised, like, well, what's wrong with that? They don't want anything going into that storm drain 
-hmm. could wind up in that basin. It could wind up in the creek. So we had to, we were in the process of rebuilding barns and we built three wash stalls inside of each barn that are tied directly to the sanitary sewer. And while we were building those barns, they made us like kind of come into compliance. So we had to dig trench drains outside, tie them directly to the sanitary sewer for people to wash horses until the barn was rebuilt with um, wash stalls in there. So uh, uh, again, and, and all along the way, when you, you would ask someone from the DEP, you know, what do you want us to do or how can we do this? They won't tell you. They'll just tell you when you come to them and say, this is what we're going to do, whether or not it's approved. Mm -hmm. So we're, we are now under a general permit um, and we're good, but we spent, we spent a lot of money and we spent a lot of time with, you know, daily, weekly inspections. Um, something simple as someone's got a bucket of water in the barn you can't toss that bucket of water outside onto the pavement. It's got to go into the wash stall. So it goes directly into the sanitary sewer. So does, that, does that include drinking anything. water buckets, Joe? What's that? Does that include drinking water buckets as well? Just clean water nope. buckets? No water can be disposed of outside the barn. You can't run a hose. You can't do anything. And now what happens now with um, a rain event, um, we were once we did all this, we were in compliance. We were able to disconnect that one basin from the sanitary sewer. So I don't pump any rainwater into the sanitary sewer now. It all goes into one basin um, that has filters in it. Again, through a swell to the other basement, that's got um, filters in it. You know, plants and stuff mm -hmm. like that to soak everything up. And it, when it overflows, it overflows and it winds up in the creek. And I, I can tell you one thing, um, just from getting a call from a neighbor that lives uh, alongside the creek, um, mm -hmm. basically thanking us for whatever we did because now the water is like really clean. So there is there is some truth to it. So do you feel like, was there a part of this process that could have been communicated to you like way earlier that would have been helpful in some of uh, these planning processes? Yeah, no, nah, because it's by the time it got... By the time they figured out what they wanted to do, I think they already had their mind made up. Mm -hmm. I know that like immediately prior to them serving us with this notice of violation, um, the DEP's budget was cut mm -hmm. um, drastically. So, you know, whether or not they were just, again, kind of looking to raise money because um, we got mm -hmm. fined quite a bit too, as, as long as everything we had to spend. Mm -hmm. And I, I think when we started talking about this, a while ago, you had mentioned this had started as you getting a CAFO permit and then had transitioned to DEP oversight? No, no, no. The, no. the CAFO permit was a result of the DEP Got coming it. to us. Because remember, we were operating under that consent order and agreement mm -hmm. for a long time, mm -hmm. like 18 years. Um, is there anything else you want to add? Because I think this is really important for people to kind of get a firsthand account of one, there are a lot of painful aspects of it. Two, it is nice to get that neighbor feedback feeling like, okay, maybe going through all of this was worth it a little bit in the end. Um, do you think it helps build any kind of social license with your community or anything like that? Um, yeah, without a, without a doubt. Because, um, you know, obviously when when this happens, you know, DEPs like to get their name in the paper that, hey, they found this and they're going to do this and they're going to do that. Um, so we're obviously a good neighbor. We're mm -hmm. doing everything we can. Um, <clears throat> I, and I can tell you that the most recent thing is, so to go along with all this, you need to have what's called an odor management plan. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be updated. It needs to be approved. There's a, you know, a, a, an inspection report that you do every year. So there was a farm next to the racetrack that was sold several years ago and a builder bought it and built about 80 homes there. So now I have all these homes like right up against my property. And basically the department of ag came in and said, um, yeah, you need a different level of, of um, BMPs for your, for your owner management plan. So it's kind of like that, you know, you had a, you had a golf course and then Somebody built homes there, and mm -hmm. then the person buys the home and complains about the golf course. So that that kind of happened. So we're now having to do 
plant some vegetation buffers between the manure barn and this new housing development. Is it primroses or lavender or how does your vegetation buffer work? Uh, it's, it's, it's all kinds of, it's a lot of like, um, Arbor Vitae's, you mm -hmm. know, stuff that stays green year round. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's a bunch of different kind of vegetation. Yeah. I can get you a list. Cool. Thank you. So, and that brings up a good point, um, that we're talking about kind of CAFOs and how it relates to water pollutant discharges. Uh, air pollutant is the next, next big topic with EPA and there are further, uh, regulatory changes coming through the proposal pipeline. So when that starts to get hot, we will talk about that next, I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joe. Stick around, we'll do a QA and a at the end. Sure. All right. So you've heard Joe talk, and again, Joe's coming from a very large operation. Um, and this is starting to sound like something that only big operations have to worry about. But the really important thing I cannot stress enough is that Animal feed operations can be designated as a CAFO at any size. One horse, two horse, three sheep, four dairy cows, up to your 500 or plus animals. That is all dependent on what your current nutrient management, manure management plan is, especially in respect to water runoff, um, going into any waters that are overseen under waters of the U.S., uh, in my example, in Massachusetts, I was coming from an area where the water table is very high. So the towns are very concerned about manure and nutrient management runoff getting into the groundwater because everyone's drinking well water and the septics are such a big issue. Um, so again, knowing that your local regulations and your state regulations and the federal CAFO regulations can designate you as a CAFO at any size, regardless of if you're a business, is really important. The other thing is that the WOTUS definitions continue to change. So just because you don't think you are proximal to a body of water, a creek, a stream, the ocean, um, being close to your farm, if those definitions continue to change in ways that uh, abutting or so many miles or kind of any other congruous wetlands are now included under WOTUS, that means your operation could then be included under WOTUS and CAFO definitions. The other big thing to remember is changing federal administrative goals really impact enforcement. So the new administration comes in, their goals are really climate oriented and EPA enforcement oriented, then you're going to see a lot more active enforcement on CAFO regulations and CAFO permitting. We're seeing it now. Um, we see a lot of kind of big goals set through the current administration for reaching water pollutant goals for reaching air pollutant goals. Um, the whole EPA plan 15 is kind of coming out of that. So knowing what the goals of the current federal administration are, and even your state ones, if you have a new state governor come in and they want to clean up your local pond, and you have a lot of ag surrounding in that area, then I would be really on my toes about kind of what regulatory proposals are coming down the line at the state level. If you need help identifying what your state level proposals are, again, you can try reaching out to your state department of ag, but also your state horse council can help you understand how laws and bills are being passed at the state level and what regulatory changes are coming down the state level. The other big thing to keep in mind, and Joe brought this up with the new community being built next to the track, is that manure stinks no matter how many horses you have. Um, and if even if you're not breaking any laws, if you're having a lot of development around your property, and you have a lot of people moving in and even though it's right to farm and even though they moved in for the rural aspect, um, but, you know, they don't want it that rural, that it actually smells rural, they can bring that to their state. That odor pollution is also an issue or your manure runoff. If you are uphill from your neighbors and even though it's not going down a stream, it's going directly into your neighbor's yard. Um, they can bring that to their state and your local board of health, and then you might see some compliance issues. So being a good neighbor is a really big part of this, even if you were there first. Um, sometimes it's a hard pill to swallow, but having a good manure management plan and a good runoff management plan is really important for uh, helping not just ensure good neighborly kind of community, but if you start to see enforcement and your neighbors are already on your side, then that's some really kind of good, powerful stuff that if you need to reach out to your community for help with either a better manure management plan or testimonials that that's not actually where your runoff is going, then that's really good to have as well. 
Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that it doesn't matter how big your property is. If you have a big property or a small property, it's all dependent on how the animals are cared for. So if they are confined to an area um, where no vegetation is growing, if you have three Cushing horses that you have to keep on a dry lot, um, then that's going to trigger that uh, animals confined to an area with no growing forage. Horses also kind of operate, you know, if your horse is out in the pasture during the day, but in stall at night, there's this gray area again with these EPA definitions of what confinement really means. So it's our job as the horse council to help kind of get to the bottom of that, but also us as owner operators, we need to understand where those gray areas are and what might trigger this kind of enforcement. So the next guest I have to speak is Jamie Cohen Wallace. And Jamie, do you prefer Jamie Wallace or Jamie Cohen Wallace? Oh, you're muted, Jamie. I'm Jamie Wallace now, but everybody <laughs> from my past life knows me as Jamie Cohen. So, you know, it depends who you talk to. <laughs> you can call I don't care. The bio you sent me, we have you at the Horse Council as a consultant for ELCR. Your bio had so much cool stuff on it. So I figured I'd let you introduce yourself and pick what you felt was most important to share with the group about why you're here and what expertise you're bringing. Uh, thanks. Uh, you know, it's interesting, <laughs> Joe, because... I worked for extension. I was an extension agent uh, for about almost 10 years. I educated horse farm owners and managers in Marion County, which is uh, essentially Ocala, Florida, but it ended up being like the state and I did some national stuff about proper manure management practices to protect the ground and surface waters. And so I had clients that had two horses. I had clients that were huge CAFOs that did sales operations, racetracks, so I fully, fully understand what happened for you guys and the changes that took place. And, 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 you know, like I had big farms who frankly would never let me on the farm. And then suddenly the DEP comes in town and wants to start finding them $10,000 a day, kind of out of nowhere. And suddenly I'm on their speed dial. So, I mean, and it, it's real and it's a problem, you know, and, and half the time, um, one of the great things about that position is that it really sort of reinforced my, um, my goodwill towards men, because I saw, I, I, I saw so many, like so many times people just didn't, we didn't know we were doing wrong. I, years and years ago, I managed a horse farm where we had a manure pile. I didn't know it was bad and no idea. That's what everyone did, you know? So a lot of it was education. So mostly what I did is I educated people and then tried to help them. And because I also extension, I worked for the government and I worked for uh, the university. So, um, you know, when they were getting in trouble with the government, I could work with kind of sort of be like, sort of like the, li the liaison, the go the person in between to say, we're working on getting this done. We're trying to get this done and then help um, the farm, the large sales organization, the large farm, whomever needed it. Uh, I'd teach them about steps that were needed and and work on the process of getting those huge changes like the things that you're talking about that you guys had to do and did over the years. I was the person who kind of like worked on cost share and grants and all those kinds of things and then education to get it done. Um, I don't know. Am I, am I, did I answer the question too long? Yes. Yes. I think you did. You're, you're our in-house know-it-all on KFOs right now. Um, so because of this, Jamie, could you speak to the importance of having a nutrient management plan, kind of regardless of what your local or federal CAFO permitting laws are, why should we be looking at nutrient management plans in general? Well, hey, I mean, this is also an interesting one for me because Joe, another thing, uh, like this, they do the nutrient management plans, the regulations vary so wildly from state mm -hmm. to state and Pennsylvania in particular is quite stringent. And I actually wrote an article years ago about how stringent Pennsylvania nutrient management plans and regulations are. Uh, and whereas where I, you know, I was in Florida and it was a lot less stringent and, you know, much less so now, but in the beginning it was, you know, there was nothing. Um, but, you know, the importance of a nutrient management plan, it's really, it gives you a plan, you know, mm -hmm. it, it helps people to understand what it really means. You know, it helps give a little bit of education. Um, it kind of keeps people keeping things orderly, in order, trying to do their best, being conscientious. Um, and, and then it can help the ground. It can help 
um, deplete or greatly decrease the amount of nutrients, which is what this is all about. I mean, we all get furious uh, and it's a pain and it's expensive, but this is about our water is really at the end of the day, we're trying to do this because we're re releasing nutrients. Uh, and unfortunately, when you have, you know, 12,000 horses at a facility and it's 50 pounds of manure a day, I mean, you do the math, do you know what I mean? I, it, it's, it, it adds up. So, um, so nutrient management planning, you know, on a, on a large scale, it's just essential for business. It's just something that has to be done now. Uh, and on a smaller scale, again, it helps even a backyard farmer uh, just kind of help them, A, keep it up in their mind about how their manure is being utilized for the farm, the property being removed. And, you know, again, like you talked about, Joe, with the neighbors, it helps with the neighbors. It can help with legislation. It just it kind of has a lot of benefits on, on a lot of levels, really. Yeah, that's a good point. Because for me, I'm I'm your small backyard farmer. I have my three yeah. horses at home, but that's still a fairy fairly sizable amount of manure every day. Mm -hmm. And I have to be cognizant of my manure pile and make sure I'm turning it when I need to be turning it, make sure I have it downhill of my well and my neighbor's wells and that I'm managing and spreading and not overloading my plan, right? Mm -hmm. So when I do that runoff, it's not nitrogen loading everything around me or my fields. Um, thank you, Jamie. So what do you see, Jamie, kind of as major concerns for the horse industry as CAFO enforcement, local or federal, kind of becomes more stringent? Um, you know, I mean, the, the problem is it always goes the same, you know, and then again, it, it like ties into like decreasing land and decreasing, decreasing opportunities for horse people to do what we love and our little crazy addiction that we all seem to have, you know, Um and, and it becomes a money issue because then, of course, it just becomes more expensive in an already expensive kind of world. Um, it's the, the legislation, it makes the industry harder to exist, you know, mm -hmm. and which is why it is beholden upon us as, you know, people who own horses, people who manage farms, people who uh, own managed tracks to make sure that we're all staying within legislation, staying within compliance. And I, I know it's difficult. I know it's expensive. I know it's a pain, but kind of once you have those systems in place, mm -hmm. it becomes a whole lot easier. Like the, 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 the problem is like, you know, the fixing the problem is a mess, but if you can already have a system or at least get yourself back to a system where you have a system, mm -hmm. then it becomes much easier. You, you know, it, it, it's just cake. It, for, for the problem with increased legislation is people who don't have a plan already uh, and not even so much a nutrient management plan, just a whole farm management, how you're managing all that stuff. You know, like you said, run off everything. Uh, just if you don't kind of have it now, it just hurts to try to do things for the future. Get that so, kind of snowball. Yeah, yeah, snowball that's, it's truly this is what it's all about. So what would your advice be to operations, um, owner operators, large venues, in terms of ensuring their compliance with local and federal rules? Um, well, I mean, see, I was an extension agent and I can't sell extension enough. I love it. It's a great organization of great, just really want to help you kind of good people. I was very specific because there were so many horses in my county and certainly not every state. Uh, extension, I'll give everybody a quick 10 second history. President Lincoln granted land uh, all sorts of universities around the country. So like University of California, Boston University, University of Florida, they all have the extension system. And, and what the extension system does is educates like adults, education, 4-H like is part of extension. So every county in every state pretty much in the country should have an extension. And me specifically, like I said, I dealt with manure management, but but you can go to extension anywhere in the country and if they don't know what they're doing. They'll certainly be able to get you into the right like um, EPA, DEP, local compliance, get you the regulations that, that you need. And they're just non-political education completely. They're good. It's just a great organization. So um, if you're looking for help, I mean, and looking for information, that's always a good place to start. Uh, and they can then get you into there's there's just so many different like ELCR again a great one on a national mm -hmm. level that where you can find education and people can teach you um you know the 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 people people just need to if we want to keep this world going for the horse world unfortunately it's, it's 
you know, we all just kind of have to sort of go in one direction though. Definitely. So is there, before we move on to the final slide, is there anything else you want to add before we move into the Q and A? No, because I'll just blab and blab. So I <laughs> <know>. <laughs> right. well, thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. So the next big question is where do we go from here? And for us as the American Horse Council, we're kind of starting to lead this initiative on CAFO education and CAFO compliance. So we want to make sure um, that us as industry participants, we're doing what we need to do because not just for the environment, which is also very important, but social license is a really big topic that we talk about a lot of the time, um, making sure that we're able to continue operating in our communities. The other thing is that we're working to understand what regulatory changes could be made uh, to exclude certain equine operations. So hopefully if you're not a CAFO, you're not getting regulated as a CAFO. Uh, one piece of language that we've been following is in Oklahoma, Oklahoma has worked into their state CAFO permitting and state regulatory operation language that any uh, racetrack that is licensed or affiliated with the Oklahoma Racing Association does not have to be regulated as a CAFO. And that is something we don't see in other states, but it's a really interesting piece of language that has been formalized in Oklahoma uh, to help protect the racing industry there. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that learning your local compliance requirements. So we've talked about racetracks, we've talked about owner operators, we've talked about small family farms. Um, horse show venues is a really big one. Uh, auction houses, sale houses, those are really big ones. So places we say where horses are kept confined, the horse doesn't have to live there. If you have 300 horses cycling in and out over this 45 day kind of accumulated period in one year, that might trigger the CAFO compliance. So if you are a horse show facility and you show a uh, host, you know, horse shows 20 weeks a year, that's gonna trigger this. Even though those want that one horse is only on the property for maybe 48 hours at a time, um, because you then have a thousand horses cycling in and off the property in this amount of time, then that's going to trigger it. Um, knowing your local compliance requirements. So we talked about the EPA, uh, NIPTI's website. You can find your local representative. We talked about your local state department of ag. Um, Jamie mentioned ELCR, so the Equine uh, Land Resource. I can never remember which one. What's Equine it? Land Conservation Resource. Thank you. Thank you. Equine Land Conservation Resource. Um, and also Cooperative Extension, like Jamie mentioned, is another really great one. I will also throw out there your FSA, your Farm Services Agent, um, the NCRS, your National Conservation Resources Service. I'm actually working with my local ones right now. They're going to help me with some pasture fencing. So there's actually some grants out there as well for different conservation resources you need to be doing. Um, but knowing your local compliance uh, requirements and knowing that there's someone out there to ask for help. Like Joe experienced, they might not be the most helpful person you can find, but they might be able to help you uh, reach a different agency who can answer your questions. And like we experienced when we called uh, the different departments for our CAFO research initially, um, a lot of them don't even know how to answer horse CAFO questions. So that's on our end to try to help kind of better get clarification on. And Emily, I'm just going to jump in because Joe yeah. did mention uh, consultants, actually. And like I have had um, friends and people that I worked with in, in different organizations that, that that they did nutrient management plans as a professional. Mm -hmm. And and they if you talk about knowledgeable, like really knowledgeable, you know, mm -hmm. so um, th those are those are those are some good people to talk to. You know, it could give you some good, good help with things like that as well. Cool. So we're going to move to the Q&A, but just before we do, you can learn more at horsecouncil.org. That's the American Horse Council website. Or you could email me questions directly at esterns at horsecouncil.org. And if you have questions for Jamie or Joe, I'm happy to help connect you with them further. Um, so happy to look in the chat or take any live questions from here. Emily, remind the group when you, the intern did the research for us, how many CAFOs did they find across the country at each, the small, medium, large? How many are there out there? 
So this is a great question. So horse CAFOs under the NIPTES permits, um, for comparison, there are about 100,000 uh, dairy and beef operations. Um, there are less than 100 NIPTES permitted horse operations. So this is something that hasn't really been an issue before. Um, and part of that is because when the Clean Water Act was initially, you know, identifying concentrated animal feed operations as point source dischargers, because horses aren't considered food or fiber, that the real intent for CWA uh, point source discharges was feedlots, where you have a high number of animals concentrated outside, typically open air, rain is just raining straight on the manure in the field, running off, um, or in the field in those concentrated barn areas, running off water, running through the barns, um, overflowing wet manure pits, which was a really big issue. Uh, so this kind of issue of horse compliance is a recent one in the past five or six years. Or in Joe's experience since the 90s, but it's it's been later after 1970 for sure. And like Jamie said, um, and Joe's experience, Pennsylvania is one of the stricter ones. We also have uh, North Carolina and Maryland, um, and now California is starting to work its way up. And just my experience in Massachusetts, there are a lot of strict local city laws that are impacting things like nutrient management plan requirements and number of animals on the property. And I, I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to jump in again, because you're right about that, Emily. Um, the, the 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 larger like national always supersedes everything but mm -hmm. you'd be amazed uh to, to learn your local and state legislation because some some places are they're quite strict it just kind of mm -hmm. depends where you are you know mm -hmm. my hometown uh in the span of you know 10 years went from being fairly ag friendly to requiring uh a half acre per horse and you needed a minimum of three acres to have any horses And if you want the next town over, uh, if you want to keep animals, you have to have a strict manure management plan, nutrient management plan. The nutrient management plan calculates how many animals you're allowed to have. Again, animal control comes around every year and counts them all, stands on the edge of your field and counts them all. Kelsey, did you have a question? I saw you unmute yourself. Yeah. Um, so howdy, I'm the extension horse specialist at Texas A&M University. And um, in collaboration with a group here that educates about watersheds and environmental management. Um, I often speak on this topic, but I also try to include um, information about mortality management and its impact. Um, do you, as guest speakers, have any um, input or thoughts on that, or even from the American Horse Council as well? Julie, do you want to, did you have a response to that? I think Joe's got something. Joe, okay. Uh, no, I was just going to say, I, I I don't think I'm the person to answer that because, like I said, I'm a I'm a racetrack. So I have, you know, for the most part, um, very fit horses that are, you know, yeah, they do come in and out. But it's not like I have, you know, 8000 horses here. And basically you are dealing with that on a daily basis. So but but not here at the track. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you have anything to add, Jamie? Um, I will say the University of Florida, I'm not an expert in horse mortality. I'm not going to lie to you about that. But um, the University of Florida, actually, they have done some horse whole horse composting. It's pretty mm -hmm. interesting stuff. Um, and again, this is where like you can get papers and you, um, May, is it Megan? Is that correct? Um, from extension, that, but there, there, there would be some very interesting... Um, articles that you could find on a university level about horse composting if you wanted to look about that and and again i'm always trying to sell extension because so talk to your extension agents because they can help so <laughs> yeah in terms on that note um in terms of extension minnesota extension has done a ton of horse composting mm -hmm. uh, outreach and i believe uh, I want to say it was minnesota i can find the paper for you chelsea but i saw a paper um 
where they were doing studies on kind of barbital breakdown in mm -hmm. composted horses versus buried horses and just in buried horses in general where it involved tennis balls and buried tubes and all kinds of stuff but it was really interesting and so it is part of the conversation yeah I'm, I'm familiar with those resources I just wondered if does this go hand in hand with manure management when we're talking about regulations um or is it something that people haven't quite noticed yet I guess so, I mean, it's a pretty big carcass so <laughs> yeah I can tell you from firsthand experience um living in the northeast disposing of a horse body is very difficult mm -hmm. uh, you know I was out in Colorado for a summer and you would go to their dump and for $25 you can be bring a carcass to the dump there um horse carcass cow whatever in Massachusetts and in New Hampshire, and in New Hampshire, I can bury on property because it's in that kind of gray area because no one really says or asks any questions, live free or die. Um, but in Massachusetts, because the water table is so high, it's actually illegal to bury animals euthanized with pentobarbital um, in most towns. And so that means is unless you are uh, burying horses when you shouldn't, which is definitely... Um, something that happens I can point out where all my childhood ponies are buried um but it it means the cost of aftercare is, is really high and horses are either cremated or trucked to other states um either New Hampshire Maine or there's a group that composts compassionate composting in Maine um but it it makes aftercare and carcass disposal definitely part of the conversation mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Emily, I see we've got uh, about three minutes left on our time here. So you want to... Yes, there was a couple questions in the chat. So... Um, and then I've got a couple of wrap-up points. Okay. Tex says, live free even in death. My husband and I often say, live free or die often just means die. Like, <laughs> it's definitely how it seems to go up here. Um, and for the question of horse limits per acre, was that within city limits? So yes, that's in the town of Yarmouth where I grew up. Um, and, uh, it's limited to the town of Yarmouth. It's not a statewide regulation or a county regulation. Um, and Megan asked, are there programs to help horse owners be able to afford making the required changes if they fit in the stipulations for a CAFO? So I will say that it's unrelated to CAFO, but related in that it is agriculture program. So USDA through the NRCS, National Resource or National Conservation Resource Service, um, has grants for agricultural operations. Um, so you have to produce a food or fiber. I am qualifying for this because I am bringing sheep to my horse property. Um, but if you are willing to have a food or fiber service on your farm, um, you can qualify for some of these conservation abatement service grants. Um, fencing for pasture, manure pit remediation, uh, farm road re remediation, all kinds of different things. There's a whole kind of host of stuff out there and USDA has kind of opened up some of these grants further through their rural development programs. Thanks. Great question, Megan. Thanks, Emily. So thank you for, again for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I wanted to remind you that the American Horse Council does a monthly podcast. And coming up on our next podcast, we have a professor from the University of Florida, Dr. Caitlin Luzman, um, who recently completed a thesis on how youth equine experiences impact Authentic Leadership Development. It's a fascinating paper, and we're really excited about having her, so we hope you'll you'll uh, listen in. We post the webinar and our podcast up on our website, so if you can't make it you know, to listen to the podcast, it's on Horses in the Morning Radio Network, or you can go to our website and hear it there. Uh, if you have suggestions for future webinars or podcast speakers, by all means, reach out to me and let me know, uh, and we'll see if we can get those in the mix. We're starting working on uh, the 2024. Again, I can't believe that we're so close to the end of the year, <laughs> but we're talking about 2024, so we've got some time to get some, some folks lined up. So thanks, Emily. Thanks, Jamie and Joe, uh, for your time and sharing your knowledge and your insights with us. And uh, if you guys have follow-up questions, reach out to Emily. She shared her email address and she's happy to point you to resources or make introductions or whatever. Thank you, Jamie and Joe, a lot for your time today.
My pleasure. Thanks. Have a good one. Thank you, Thank you so much.